Hello everyone, uh, this is Mojtaba from the UMass Amherst Student Chapter of INFORMS. Uh, welcome back to our interview series. Uh, today we are very happy to have with us uh, Dr. Dahlberg uh, at Super Network Lab. So uh, Dr. Dahlberg is an assistant professor at the Royal uh, Danish Defense College. He, is also, uh, he has a background in history and a PhD in uh, disaster research from the University of Copenhagen. And uh, he is also a co-founder of the Copenhagen Center for Disaster Research. Thank you for being here, Doctor. It's a pleasure. So I would like to begin this interview with a question regarding uh, your research and your talk, which was very interesting. So what motivated you to study resiliency-related problems? I, I think what motivated me, first of all, was curiosity, plain, mm -hmm. plain old curiosity. Yeah. That's always a, a good point of departure for mm -hmm. any kind of yeah. research. Because when uh, I, I, I joined the Master of Disaster Management program mm -hmm. at the Copenhagen University in 2010, first as an, uh, 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 just as a lecturer and mm -hmm. then later as a PhD student, and and that was sometime around that time we, the concept of resilience mm -hmm. arrived in Denmark. Yeah, I, and. I, as far as I remember, it was a it was a visiting scholar from mm -hmm. the U.S. Mm -hmm. who started talking about resilience, mm -hmm. and I remember my later PhD supervisor and 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 um, uh, and I we were in a meeting with her, and and none of us really knew what it was, and and we were just nodding and saying yes, and then we mm -hmm. ran out and and looked it up in a dictionary mm -hmm. afterwards. And resilience, oh, it's something about. Um, systems that mm -hmm. can cope with uh, mm -hmm. unforeseen events and so mm -hmm. um, that's quite interesting and then I um, I got funding for a PhD in disaster research from the Danish Emergency Management Agency in 2013 and uh, I, I decided to to focus my mm -hmm. my PhD project on the concept of resilience mm -hmm. and I got the chance to more or less introduce this concept to the uh, community of Danish professionals in the field of emergency mm -hmm. and disaster management. So I, I had to figure it out. <laughs> that, was, that was really interesting because that was that was at a time when there was still a lot of uh, was a lot of literature coming out. Mm -hmm. It was uh, still uh, less than 10 years after the Hugo Framework for Action, which I believe yeah. 2005 was the first mm -hmm. like uh, um, big international mm -hmm. uh, treaties or agreement that mm -hmm. built on the concept of resilience and community resilience and all that. So uh, so it, it was an interesting time to, to yes. start working on resilience. Yes. So yeah, now uh, that time has passed and now uh, we see the climate change is in the top of the news everywhere, uh, every day. And so how has climate change impacted this area of research? I saw that uh, you were talking about that. So tell us about how it has impacted your area of research. Yeah, coming from a, a small country, that which is unfortunately a very low-lying country mm -hmm. with uh, with uh, no mountains or anything, we are very close to the sea. Yes. Uh, so so rising sea levels has a, uh, um, a lot of consequences for, for, for Denmark and Danish mm -hmm. communities and society as a whole. So there's a lot of there's a there's a lot of uh, focus on climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and innovation that comes out of climate change, and and you, as you know, would know, all good research start with funding. Yes. <laughs> so so where is the funding? The funding is, to a large degree, that there are, I think there are two main areas of funding right now in my field. Mm -hmm. that one is so societal security. Yeah. One is climate change, uh, and the other one is climate change. Yes. So so I've been fortunate enough to have my uh, one mm -hmm. uh, leg and uh, one <laughs> foot in in both mm -hmm. camps. Um, so there's a lot of of uh, Funding uh, and, and research on climate ch climate change adaptation techniques like the well, physical mm -hmm. the built uh, environment, uh, sea walls, mm -hmm. uh, uh, water basins for uh, uh, torrential rain and all that. Mm -hmm. And but there's also the um, the softer approaches, mm -hmm. the community resilience approach, which is more the field that I've been. Mm -hmm. Working with, so so climate change is is at it's high on the agenda in Denmark. Mm -hmm. It we we uh, we see it every time there's an election. That's mm -hmm. more or less the we have a um, uh, a fairly large number of political parties in yes. Denmark. We have coalition governments, 
and they're more or less fighting to be the greenest party uh-huh. uh, from both sides of, of, mm-hmm. of the aisle, which is of course good. Yeah, but good it, thing it, for it, it's also, uh, but it 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 um, there is there's quite a lot of funding this area so that of course also directs a lot of uh, mm. research attention to, yes. to this uh, to this area yeah nice so the third question is very related to this so you started with the new topic of resiliency and now you are dealing with climate change and what are future challenges or opportunities for research in your field that did not exist several years ago well i have uh, on a personal note i have sort of left the resilience field because I'm now, as you said in the introduction, I'm an assistant professor at the Royal Danish Defense College. So I have myself moved more into the uh, into war theory, mm-hmm. military history. I think looking at at my old field, the uh, disaster research risk uh, reduction field, <coughs> I think the future challenge is integration because the, when, when, when the field is new, there's research in all different areas. Mm-hmm. So what I think for the next decade, 2020s, the, uh, the challenge will be in holistic approaches, trying to integrate everything mm-hmm. into a, a larger framework, mm-hmm. which is, uh, there is, especially at the European Union level, there's a lot of funding for the mm-hmm. next mm-hmm. seven years for the next European framework yes. program. F- also for climate change mm-hmm. uh, uh, research, and I hope a lot of that will go into more whole of society approaches, mm-hmm. trying to integrate all these things. Because, as I also uh, talked about in, in in my lecture here today, uh, there is my 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 favorite story of of the uh, the the uh, climate change adaptation techniques that we have implemented in. Uh, all Danish municipalities for overflow water basins for uh, for, for torrential rain for cloud mm-hmm. bursts, but it ra- very rarely happens. So they are usually empty, just with a bit of water in the mm-hmm. bottom. And they have now, uh, in some areas in Denmark, proven to be perfect breeding grounds for mosquitoes. So mm-hmm. we might be f- uh, looking at a risk of of malaria oh. in the zoo. that was not what we had planned for. So mm-hmm. so this just shows that you can yeah, close everything one, is connected. You close yeah. one hole and then. Uh, another one opens in the yeah. in the uh, Swiss cheese. Exactly. Uh, so, th- so now we have had one or two decades of experience with resilience and mm-hmm. climate change adaptation techniques and all that. Now we need for real to integrate it mm-hmm. into a whole yeah, of society approach. Yeah, that's, that's a that's huge challenge. Yes, I yeah. understand. Yeah. So speaking of uh, military stuff and uh, connecting everything together, so what is the connection between military history and war theory and disaster and resiliency research and how has having the experience and the expertise in these disciplines has helped you uh, in your research? Yeah, that's actually, I, I like that question <laughs> uh, because I, I, I came to the Danish Defense College uh, mm-hmm. two and a half years ago and, uh, and I'm a civilian uh, employee so I, I, I teach at the uh, diploma and master's uh, levels at the Defense College with the Army and mm-hmm. Navy and Air Force Academies. Uh, so of course I, I, I tr- I've tried to to bring what, whatever I could from my mm-hmm. background into this field and it, 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 it dawned upon me that there's actually have more in common than you would think mm-hmm. because for instance <coughs> A lot of resilience uh, research is about networks, community yes. networks, social capital, and all mm-hmm. that. Is, uh, how to build strong uh, communities to cope with unforeseen events, extreme events, mm-hmm. and all this. Uh, and some of the, we just do it the other way around sometimes mm-hmm. in the military thinking because when 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 we go to war in the age of asymmetrical warfare. It will often be against networks like yes. Al Qaeda, uh, ISIS, and so forth. Mm. So, so it's actually it's eighty percent the same, yes. just with uh, uh, you approach it from the opposite direction. Now we're looking at a network that we want to destroy mm-hmm. instead. So yes. we want to reduce the resiliency of yes. the opponent. Yes. Economic network. Yeah, and I was I'm I'm I'm, a, I'm a in the US because I'm a visiting scholar at Northeastern University for a couple of months and mm-hmm. I was discussing this with a couple of colleagues and one of them gave a very good presentation about network analysis, social network analysis mm-hmm. in Japan mm-hmm. following the 
Fukushima Daiichi mm-hmm. uh, uh, disaster almost 10 years ago. And he was mapping this network and he had singled out three nodes where the out of six, seven hundred people in this recovery network of mm-hmm. committees. And he had singled out three guys who were the most important in oh, this yes. network. And I said to him, Yo, if this was a, an intelligence analysis, mm-hmm. that's very that's very neat to know because now we can just go in and then we can kill those three guys. Yes. And then the network collapsed. And he turned kind of pale and, yeah. and mm-hmm. they said, Oh, you're military guys, you're always so cynical in your approaches. <laughs> but that is yes. that's just the other way around. So it has a lot uh, in, common. in common, actually, and mm-hmm. uh, I uh, uh, contributed with a, a chapter for a, a book uh, last year on uh, lessons learned from from Danish military history, and we actually put in a chapter on resilience mm-hmm. because that is that is also a f- theoretical framework that we can use to learn something about uh, what actually worked. Yes, uh, in when we look back at military history. Mm-hmm. Because a resilient, uh, you know, uh, as I think uh, Bradley said that uh, amateurs talk about uh, strategy, uh, experts talk about logistics. Yes. So, so if you can, if you can create a resilient mm-hmm. logistics system for your army, then it has a much better chance of winning the battle, of winning the war, yes. than if it's non-resilient. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a, this has a lot of yeah, a, strong very connections that I was not really aware of. Yeah, actually. Yeah. So, and uh, you are not only, I mean, uh, you are you have expertise in many uh, disciplines, so this is another thing is that you are not only a successful <coughs> academic, you are also a novelist and media star. So any suggestions as to how we can better disseminate this disaster research and studies to policymakers and at public, uh, the public at large. Well, I've actually I've always wanted to write novels. That was my my plan from the beginning. Mm-hmm. But but I had to uh, also make a living. Uh, <laughs> so so that was how I ended up in research. Um, but uh, uh, I don't know. I wouldn't call myself a media star. Denmark is a small country. It's not that <laughs> difficult to, <laughs> to get into the media. But, but I've been I've been fortunate enough to be mm-hmm. uh, to 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 write novels that are in some ways connected with the research I'm doing, and I, I like that. It's just yes. one outlet for yeah. my uh, for the insights that I gain from my mm-hmm. uh, my my research. Um, while doing my uh, my PhD, I published. Um, a trilogy, mm-hmm. uh, my disaster trilogy, um, three novels, uh, looking at. I always like disaster movies, like the really bad ones, which <laughs> are the best best ones, you know, like San Andreas and yeah. 2012 and all that. Yeah, same really. Really. <laughs> yeah uh, like uh, it's, it's a simple recipe. Yeah. Use uh, re- re- fairly bad mm. uh, actors. Uh, <laughs> A terrible dialogue and a stupid plot, <laughs> uh, and and then add a lot of effects. Yes. But we don't have a tradition for disaster movies in Denmark because they're so mm. expensive mm-hmm. to make. So I figured, hmm, it's not, it's it's not more expensive to destroy a city in a novel mm-hmm. yes. than than to write a novel about two people mm. and uh, having a love affair yeah. in a small apartment. So, so I, I, I I wanted to do that. So I published uh, a trilogy about. Natural hazards that happened that that unfolded in mm-hmm. in history and replayed them in modern times, mm-hmm. playing with the idea of vulnerability of modern society. So I took like the solar storm mm-hmm. of the Carrington event, September eighteen fifty nine. Mm-hmm. There was not a lot of electricity in the world back then, but what if this an, a solar storm uh, of the same magnitude would hit the Earth, Earth today? No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it and it plays out in Copenhagen. Yeah. And my main character is a experienced disaster manager so uh-huh. she has some some special abilities and insights so she can like we see the mm-hmm. the, the plot unfolds f- we see it through her eyes mm-hmm. and then I wanted to write one about earthquakes but we don't have any seismic zones in Denmark mm-hmm. so I shipped her off to uh, San Francisco uh-huh. and she has really bad timing in her life so so she <laughs> arrives in San Francisco f- uh, yeah, four good. days before the big quake of the San Andreas mm-hmm. Fault and then she comes back to Denmark in the last mm-hmm. installment of the series and there is a, a, a storm surge mm-hmm. uh, like the one I talked about in my lecture today mm-hmm. in the Baltic in the 1872 and that happens again. It's like rerunning uh, 
fact, and it's fact based, but mm-hmm. it's I use it in a, in a, for a, a, a work of fiction. Mm-hmm. It's a story, mm-hmm. and and um, I like to disseminate my research in that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, perhaps I'm privi- privileged because I have experience with writing thriller, n- thriller novels from earlier, but I thought this was f- this was fun, and it, that has given me. Uh, it has uh, allowed me to get into the uh, into mass media, mm-hmm. because I get reviews, I get uh, interviews, and then I get the opportunity to mm-hmm. sit on the morning show in Danish national television and talk about mm-hmm. my book, and then at the same time, talk about my research. Yeah. So so. Uh, uh, so any suggestions I think we should as researchers always acknowledge that there's a lot of people out there hungry mm-hmm. for information hungry for for important information because there's sorry pardon my friends there's so much crap there's so much mm-hmm. tabloid there's so much uh, uh, bad TV game shows and reality out mm-hmm. there and and there's there's a lot there's a huge target group for fact based interesting good dissemination of knowledge. Mm-hmm. So just get out there, uh, go out, practice, give offer yourself as a public speaker, mm-hmm. uh, do YouTube channels, mm-hmm. uh, practice. Uh, one of the the most useful uh, exercises I did at my uh, when I was at the at the university when I did my master's in history was to do student radio show mm-hmm. and we were so bad it <laughs> sucked we were really the technical level was below the, f- the, f- the floorboards but we uh, w- uh, for one hour once a week for a year mm-hmm. we practiced yeah, and we got yeah. better and mm-hmm. and that is that's how to do it and and also always remember that there is there is life outside academia mm-hmm. we, we have a I, I would even say some kind of obligation also mm-hmm. to to uh, not just not only focus on the next grant mm-hmm. but the next peer-reviewed publication that yes. five people will read. Mm-hmm. Also, um, we should uh, dig deep inside ourselves and 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 this, uh, tell that story mm-hmm. that we want to tell about yes. the things that uh, we know a lot about and and. It's, uh, it sounds almost pathetic. Give a little back to society. Yeah. Well, thank you. There were, I mean, really valuable suggestions <laughs> and advice. So speaking of advice and also speaking of these many things that you are doing, teaching, writing, research, uh, can you speak to work-life balance given all of your activities and endeavors? I don't. Uh, if you ask my ex-wife, I'm not the best expert uh, to, <laughs> to give out advice on that. No. Um, have fun, mm-hmm. uh, and and uh, uh, avoid faculty meetings at all cost. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I, I hope my boss will not uh, watch <laughs> this. Um, I I I live quite far away from my office, which mm-hmm. is good because yeah. then I only have to go in. A couple of days a week. Okay. So, so I, I try to, um, I try not to waste time. Mm-hmm. And there's so much. You can waste so much time mm-hmm. if you uh, if you if you don't focus on it. Um, so, so when I go to the office, I don't expect to get any work done. I'm at the office to to ha- to drink coffee with my colleagues, mm-hmm. to network, to. Uh, uh, we have a, like a running club. That's the most important time mm-hmm. of the week. And uh, in my office, we go, uh, we do a five k together with the boss, yeah. and my colleagues. That is, that is where we share the uh, valuable informal knowledge about what is happening and yes. the strategy of the department. And and that is what I do when I'm at work. And then I go home. Mm-hmm. I have a three hour commute, so I get a lot of writing done mm-hmm. on the train. Oh, that's all because there's no way to escape. So yeah. so I can do that. And then I stay at home and. Uh, and enjoy life with my wife and, and my, uh, my children and uh, and read and uh, I don't I can't necessarily work from eight in the morning until five in the afternoon mm-hmm. so some t- so I I also feel privileged but I enjoy the freedom of being able to work when I want to if I, I I'm, a, I'm a late riser so mm-hmm. so I want to just uh, stare into the wall and drink coffee until 11 in the morning and then but but uh, 
I love to write all through the night. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then I go somewhere um, when I know I have to finish a book. Mm-hmm. I, I often go on a warship. Mm-hmm. I have access because I'm yes. at the uh, Defense College. So I get a... Two years ago, I went on a, a three-week trip mm-hmm. with the Icelandic Coast Guard, which yeah. is a perfect place nice. to write a book. Yeah. And then I'm... Uh, then I can finish it, and then I go back to my family, and then I don't have to feel bad mm-hmm. all the time for not working when I'm with them. So mm-hmm. it's, I don't think I'm 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 the best work-life balance coach, mm-hmm. um, because uh, I'm one of those people who say that work is my hobby and hobby is yeah. my work, and uh, but I really enjoy it, yeah. and um, I'm just fortunate enough to find a. Uh, a life partner mm-hmm. who also feels the same way mm-hmm. about uh, her work. He, she's not in research. She she owns a wine bar, mm-hmm. so it's a perfect match. Yes. So I can, I can. It it helps my work life balance that I can work at her yeah. at her bar. Yeah, well. <laughs> not my health, perhaps. But, yeah, uh, but uh, I, I would enjoy say it. you're <laughs> living a dream life. Actually. I like it. Yeah. I'm very happy. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. So, uh, I wish we could continue to move more than this, but uh, we have time limitations. So, thank you so much. I think that was a uh, great thank you for advice. Me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. And yeah, thank you for uh, accepting to doing this interview. We really appreciate. It. Thank you, and thank you everyone for watching uh, this video. Thanks.